Um, <clears throat> last month, uh, we spent a lot of our time thinking about the Christmas story um, in the book of Luke. Uh, we spent, I guess, about six six sermons starting the Christmas story and through Jesus' early childhood, only leaving Luke one time in Matthew. Um, so we've dealt a lot in Luke so far, in Luke chapter 2 and some in chapter 1. So what we're going to do uh, this in January, we've got some special things going on in January and February that we'll kind of skip around a little bit. But we're going to go back and we're going to fill in what we, what we missed. Um, so hopefully after we get through some special Sundays coming up this month and next month to um, pick back up and, and Luke chapter 3 and, uh, and keep on uh, cruising through Luke. So we're going to go back these next some of these weeks in, in January and, and early February to fill in some of the gaps that we, that we missed when we were preaching the Christmas story. So um, just wanted to let you know where we're, where we're headed with that. So Luke chapter 1, let's, let's just kind of get an idea of who this, this Luke guy is. Um, very significant uh, part of the Bible, the New Testament, was written by this guy, Luke. Now, he doesn't identify himself um, here in the gospel as the writer, the author of this gospel, but this gospel of Luke and its sequel, which is the, the Acts of the Apostles, both of those books were written by Luke. And that's been really not, not contended at all. I mean, that's undisputably, the early church, just, it just hadn't uh, been contested at all. So um, we, we know that, that Luke was the author of this book. So in these two volumes, the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, Luke's, this is very, very cool, Luke's contribution to the New Testament takes up more space, more volume, than any other writer of the New Testament. Any single writer in the New Testament did not write as much as Luke did. That's significant, as we'll hear in just a second. It appears that Luke wasn't an eyewitness to the Lord and his ministry on earth, but he heard about the gospel and he trusted in Christ. So we see through the scriptures that Luke was a companion and a fellow worker with Paul. Let me give you a few references if you'd like to take notes and look at things later. Um, Acts chapter 16, verses 10 and 11 shows that. 2 Timothy 4, 11. And Philemon 1, 24. Uh, clue us in that Luke was um, traveling with Paul and ministering with Paul. He was even with Paul up to the end of, of Paul's life before his execution. So he's a very faithful partner with Paul. And as we look at Colossians chapter 4, verses 10 through 14, we surmise that Luke was a Gentile. Okay? So that's, that's why I think it's, it's really interesting that Luke wrote more of the New Testament than any other single writer, even those that were Jews. That God gave a Gentile. More space in the New Testament than any specific individual Jew. God loves the Jews, and he, I mean, as the Gen, well, he loves the Jews too, but he loves the Gentiles and he wants to use the Gentiles as, as well. Um, so from Colossians, this, this, uh, ver these verses in Colossians, we also see that Luke was a physician and he was loved. All right? So from our text today here in Luke chapter 1, we see that Luke was a careful researcher and a historian. We're going to see that he investigated all the stuff that he wrote about. And he investigated it really, really well in detail and carefully verified everything. He's a very careful researcher and historian. So Warren Wearsby says this, thinking about the fact that he's a, a researcher and a historian, but also a physician, he says this. He wrote, Luke, he wrote with the mind of a careful historian but with the heart of a loving physician. And what a grace that these truths come to us from such a, a source. So as we read Luke's gospel, what we're going to see him focus on, we're going to see him focus on a lot of different things. He'll focus on prayer. He'll focus on the Holy Spirit. He'll focus on the kingdom of God. He'll focus on the second coming of Christ, among other things. But there's two things I want to highlight this morning that, that, uh, that Luke really, really focuses on. It's a, very much the theme of his, of his gospel. We're going to see him present Jesus as the perfect man. 
the Son of Man, but who is also the Son of God, sent from God, according to God's plan to be our Savior by his death and resurrection <clears throat> for our sins. In his companion volume, Acts, it, he, he, he's quoting uh, Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2 where, where, where Peter says that Jesus was delivered up according to the plan and foreknowledge of God. So it was, it was, it was God's plan for Jesus to come. But bringing salvation to the lost in, in his gospel here in chapter 19, verse 10, in the story of Zacchaeus, it says that, that he came to seek and save who was lost. So according to the plan of God, the sovereign plan of God, God sent Jesus to seek and to save who uh, was lost, that which was lost. So we're going to see him focus on Jesus being the Son of Man, the perfect man, but also the Son of God sent to be our Savior. And save those who were lost. But we're also going to see him uh, focus on this through this gospel. And this is beautiful and it should make you run out of here today skipping with joy. Because we're going to see him focus on God's love for all mankind. That the gospel is available to all people. We're going to see him focus on the fact that the gospel is available not just to the Jews... But to the Gentiles, he himself is a Gentile who received the gospel. Theophilus, who he's writing to, is likely a, a Gentile. It's, he says in the, in the story of the, the birth of Christ, when, when the angel came to the shepherds, the angel said, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for who? All the people. All right? In Simeon, when Simeon meets the eight-day-old Jesus, he grabs him in his arms. He embraces him and he says, Jesus is going to be a light and revelation to the Gentiles. Jesus also mentions uh, very early on, I, I think it's in chapter 4, you can, you can check me on that. But he mentions the healing of Naaman the leper back in the Old Testament. Naaman was a Gentile and God gave healing to a Gentile back then. The, the book of Acts is full. This is Luke. Luke wrote Acts. The book of Acts is full of God sending the message of the gospel to the Gentiles. Even Luke's genealogy in chapter 3 of his gospel, there's two genealogies of Jesus in, in the New Testament. The first one is in Matthew. Matthew starts Jesus' ancestral line from Abraham, a Hebrew, a Jew. But Luke traces Jesus' line all the way back to who? Adam. That Jesus is is he, he is, he, he's the father, you know, he's focusing on that, that God is for all people. Adam is all of our, all of our fathers. So he traces his genealogy from Adam. And even in the end of his gospel, Luke chapter 24, verse 47, this is what he says. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So Luke is going to focus on the fact that the gospel, God's love, he's focused on all people, not just his chosen folks, the Jews, although their role in his salvation plan is very, very crucial. But also, he's going to, we're going to see Luke focus on God having a, a love and a care for all stripes of people, all types of people, the outcasts, the people whose society might you know, not think very highly of. Again, going back to the announcement of Jesus' birth, he announces Jesus, the first people to hear about it are the shepherds, the, the outcasts of society. In some of Luke's parables that he talks about, in Luke we have the, the parable of the prodigal son who wasted his inheritance, was a rebellious sinner, but that when he came to his senses and repented and came back to, to his father, his father embraced him, and that was a picture of the love of God for even the wayward sinner. The persistent widow, he has a, a parable about the persistent widow, right? You can, you can read that, and, and the widow has a special need, a special segment of society that God has particular love for. You, you remember the parable in Luke of the rich man and Lazarus, where the rich man has all this food, and the beggar, you know, is just, just sitting there waiting for for, for uh, 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 scraps from his table, but when they both die, the rich man goes to hell, and the beggar 
goes to heaven. And he's just focusing on God's love for even the poor. This, Luke talks about the, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And again, the Samaritans were not liked, a not an outcast. You know, the Jews really didn't like Samaritans and likewise, but God loved them. And the hero in the Good Samaritan story, other than Christ himself, was the Samaritan. So he's focusing on all types of people, all types of sinners even. Um, we see him, uh, uh, we see Luke share the story of the woman, the sinful woman, the woman of the city that comes and, and repents and is, and is wetting Jesus' feet with her tears and wiping them with her hair. God loves even the worst sinners. And he loves women. You know, Back then, women were... We're just a different class of society and not really as respected as men. But we see him highlight, I think it's in chapter 8, but again, check me on that. But that women were accompanying Jesus and, and going with him and walking with him and with him. Again, this sinful woman that, that Jesus um, uh, dealt with there who was, who was washing uh, his feet with her hair and her tears. We see him dealing with lepers, a more outcasts of society, tax collectors. We see him... Tell the story of Zacchaeus. People didn't like tax collectors. They didn't like Zacchaeus. But Jesus took special time out to, to say, Zacchaeus, I want to come to your house. And he brought salvation to Zacchaeus. So all types of stripes of people, all types of sinners, all types of outcasts, Jesus is focused on. Even the thief on the cross who was worthy of his death but who proclaimed faith in Christ even while he was on the cross. And Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. And even Jesus himself was an outcast. He had to be born in a manger and was rejected and went to the cross. This, this should be an encouragement to you today. That Jesus, God has a heart for all mankind. Those who are uppity, those who are low, everybody God has a heart for. So wherever you find yourself on the figurative, and I don't even like this, but this is the way we think sometimes, totem pole of life. If you think, hey, I'm just kind of down here, hey, I'm a little here. God just loves the whole, the whole pole. He loves us all. And the gospel has come to all of us. What encouragement that is for us today. Warren Wearsby again says that, that Luke presents Jesus Christ as the compassionate Son of Man who came to live among sinners, love them, help them, and die for them. So, that gives us a little introduction into, into Luke. So let's look at Luke's trustworthy investigation and the purpose of his writing this gospel. Because here, here's, the, here's the bottom line. I don't want to get lost in a bunch of information today, although I'm going to give it to you. I don't want you to miss the point. Of this information. The point of this info this morning is to see that the gospel that you believe is the truth. It's the absolute truth that is unchanged by any, any idea, any thought that comes floating through your head, any attack that comes from culture today who absolutely hates truth. This gospel truth is factual and unchanged and will not, cannot be changed as no truth can. So according to verse 3, let me, let me just read this to you. Um, Luke says, it seemed good to me also having followed all things closely for some time past. We, according to this verse 3, we see that Luke was a careful investigator. He was a careful researcher. But of what? Well, look at verse 1. It says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. So these things that have been accomplished among us is what Luke has carefully investigated. Um, so John MacArthur says that this word accomplished in verse 1, used here, it means this, quote, the complete fulfillment of something. In this case, the redemptive plan of God. He goes on to say that the Gospel of Luke, quote, shows how God accomplished salvation for his people. And so Luke is investigating these events 
that have happened, verifying these events that have happened, that show how Jesus came to accomplish God's purpose of salvation, the redemption of mankind, the people whom he loves. These gospel events, the gospel event that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, that he was God's son, but also born as a man, but that he was born with a holy nature and never sinned. The gospel event of him growing up in his, his life, the fact that he loved all these types of people, the fact that he healed, the fact that he was powerful, the fact that he had power over disease and death and, and sin and Satan, the fact that he was rejected, the fact that he did die on a cross, and when he died on that cross, he was paying the penalty for our sin. The fact that he did raise from the dead and show his victory over death. Promising us life eternal if we trust in him. The gospel event of him ascending to heaven and going back up to the Father. That he might intercede on our behalf. And Luke also talks about the coming of Christ. That he, this hasn't been accomplished yet in our view. But he is coming again. That will be accomplished as well. He will come back to redeem those who are his to go and be with him forever. These gospel events that had happened, Luke investigated closely to make sure that they had happened, to make sure that he got the story right, and he's compiling them here to give them to Theophilus. These aren't just events that happened. This is crucial, church. These aren't just events that happened. But this is how God fulfilled prophecy. These events that Luke is going to be talking about, these historical facts, are how God fulfilled prophecy and accomplished his redemption through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Um, a pastor in, uh, I think it's South Washington, D.C., a very famous pastor, I can't say his last name very well, and Enya Wiley or something like that. Anyway, he says this, the entire gospel, this entire gospel, Luke, is about God's accomplishing his plan and humans seeing him do it. So Luke is relating what has been seen about God accomplishing his plan. Also note this, too. I'll just say this really quickly. Salvation, God's plan is something that God accomplished, not something that you or I accomplished. It's just something that God accomplished. You look at the first couple chapters of Luke and you see how God initiated the coming of Christ. This isn't something that man created. This is something that God brought and God accomplished. And he still accomplishes it as he brings us to him for salvation. So Luke investigated these events uh, of God's accomplishing work in the birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension of Christ. And he's presenting them in an orderly, purposeful way to Theophilus. Uh, we don't have time to go through. We may see it as we go through Luke. But he, he has a very purposeful way. You see Jesus. Well, let me just. We'll just keep going. It's, it's, he's presenting it to Theophilus in a way that, that makes sense. That can communicate truth to Theophilus. Very, very careful presentation. That's instructive in and of itself. So that Theophilus may have, verse 4, may have certainty according to the things that he had been taught. The New American Standard Version says that, that so that he could know the exact truth, exact, reliable, certain, accurate truth. So who was this Theophilus? Again, we don't know for sure, but he is likely a person of high standing or wealth. Maybe he's a Roman official. In Luke's other volume, Acts, he... Um, yeah, when, when, when the governors, Roman officials, Felix and Festus are referred to, they're referred to as most excellent. So uh, it could be that Theophilus, as he's referred most excellent here, he could be a Roman official as well. Maybe he's just a person of high standing or great wealth. Um, but he's either an unbeliever who is interested in Christ and has been taught about Christ, or he is a new believer in Christ. And... Uh, uh, Luke is trying to strengthen the faith of by giving him uh, this, his investigative work. Theophilus' name means friend or lover of God. It's likely, too, that Luke has a wider audience in view 
um, when he's writing his gospel, but he addresses it to one man, which is interesting. We'll see that at the end of the message today. But why can Theophilus and why can we trust Luke's investigative work? Check this. Five little reasons here. The first one is, is Luke's sources. Who were Luke's sources? We don't know exactly who they were. Some say that maybe he had Matthew and Mark's Gospels. That's likely. We don't know that for sure. Some of these written narratives in verse 1 were likely sources for Luke. It could be that these written sources were eyewitnesses of Christ himself or themselves. So they communicated what they saw. And so Luke just compiled that all together from eyewitness testimony. It seems from these first verses here that Luke interviewed eyewitnesses. He had one-on-one -on -one contact with people who had been with Christ from the beginning. Apostles even. Who had walked with Christ and seen Christ up close in the events of his life. For he says, Luke says that these things were delivered to us from those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. So this is very, very likely the apostles themselves. Luke's investigation was thorough. It was careful. It was documented by credible, trustworthy sources. Luke diligently looked into these things. It wasn't just a haphazard deal. He was studying to make sure that what he presented was the truth. He investigated it all. He verified its accuracy with his research that had been traced back to reliable eyewitness sources. It, it would be like this. If, <clears throat> if, if a crime happened, whose testimony would hold up more in court? Someone who had been there or someone who had heard somebody talk about it on social media? Well, obviously the one who was there. And so Luke is going to the folks who were there to present his gospel. To find their information and present his gospel. He's been careful and not haphazard. So MacArthur says this. His careful and thorough research gave him a precise understanding of Jesus Christ's life and ministry. As a result, he was uniquely qualified to write this gospel narrative under the Spirit's inspiration. So we see his sources were a huge uh, part of his, uh, the truth of uh, us understanding this is the truth. But also, I want you to think about not just sources, but history. The events that Luke wrote about were actual historical events, not fanciful tales. You can't say that about every other religion. These were actual events. In the first three chapters of Luke, Luke's gospel, he roots events that he communicates in certain historical time frames with historical people and historical places. He's not trying to hide, you know, yeah, this kind of happened, nobody really saw it, and I'm just kind of telling you what happened, even though you can't document it. He's putting it, he's rooting it in actual history. Christianity is a faith built on actual historical events. Even Paul bases the whole Christian faith on one event. Go to 1 Corinthians, you don't have to go there now, but go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul bases the whole Christian faith on the resurrection of Christ. He says, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, if that event did not happen, your faith is futile and you're still in your sin. So Paul himself bases the whole Christian faith on one event. Our faith is based on events that have incredible implications, rooted in history. The historical events about Jesus provide the basis for our belief in their implications for our lives. So our doctrine is not made up. It's revealed to us through what God has done in Christ. We don't have a religious philosophy that some smart, creative, maybe deceptive dude or group of dudes thunk up, right? We have a faith that was accomplished, revealed, witnessed, believed, shared, and has incredible implications for our lives. Uh, John, uh, the, um, the disciple John, who wrote the Gospel of John and 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. Listen to what he says in 1st John, chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, 
which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which you have seen and heard, we proclaim to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that, so that our joy may be complete. The, these things happened and people saw them happen and they were reported to us. David Jusic says this. Listen to this. It is entirely likely that the books of Luke and Acts make up Paul's defense brief for his trial before Caesar since Acts leaves Paul waiting for that trial some people think that Luke wrote the gospel of Luke and the acts of the apostles that Paul might have a defense in his trial before Caesar to say yeah these things happen these things that Paul says he believes and he's telling you he believes and that he's preaching, yes, they happen. Here's the evidence. So if, if that is true, wouldn't you want a verifiable, documentable uh, sort, you know, presentation? Sure you would. And so Luke has done his homework. Also, Luke talks about fulfilled prophecy. How can Theophilus and we be sure of the gospel sure that what he's saying is true. Luke includes fulfillments of Old Testament prophecy and, and, and prophecies that Jesus made that were fulfilled. So seeing God accomplish what he said he would gives a certain assurance to our faith. And then also look at inspiration. We've seen sources, we've seen history, we've seen fulfilled prophecy, but also look at inspiration. Verse 3 here in Luke chapter 1 says, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past. In, in, in the New American Standard Version, it's, it's this phrase in verse 3 says, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning. Now that last phrase, from the beginning, could be translated from above. Many sources say that this, he, what he could be saying is, by investigation, you know, and what I see has come from above, suggesting the inspiration of God upon Luke's writing. But regardless if that is true or not, we know that Luke's writing was inspired by God, given by God, that God wrote it. Because in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says that all scripture is God-breathed. So we know Luke's words are from God. But notice how God inspired these words. What exact words he wanted written. He superintended Luke's desire. Notice he says this. It says, it seemed good to me. Right? So God used uh, Luke's desire. He used his research. He used his words. He used God kind of within this whole thing of who he came in contact with and what information he got and what knowledge he got and what thoughts he thunk. <laughs> And, and what he included and what he didn't include to make sure that every single letter and every grammatical structure that God wanted in his gospel was in there. So what this shows us is that Luke didn't like go in this room and enter some zombie trance and that God was like, okay, right in. You know, God used the person that he made Luke and he, and he he, he, he took Luke and he said, okay, I'm going to guide you here and I want you to see this and I want you to think this. And God is using and working into all these ways to get every single letter, every single word, every single sentence, every single story, every single thing that God wanted in his scripture, in the gospel of Luke, to make sure it was there. God uses us in the way that he designed us. So did Luke write this gospel? Yeah, he did. Did God write it? Yes, he did. God guided Luke to do what he did, to write what he wrote. Wow. God is in control. We can trust what Luke wrote because God wrote it. So knowing these words are from God, it gives us great certainty in what we are reading. So here's a side note. I have to say this. 
Uh, J.C. Ryle says this. It's a great quote. Let it be a set. Listen, if you kind of lost me, I want you to hear this. Let it be a settled principle with us in reading the Bible that when we cannot understand a passage or reconcile it with some other passage, the fault is not in the book, but in ourselves. If God wrote this and he did, he didn't make a mistake. And if we can't understand it, it's not his fault. We don't put the fault on him. We put the fault on our finite, fallible, unable to understand everything mind. And so we seek him and we ask him to reveal to us what his truth is. So your ability to understand the scriptures that, that may lead you to say, well, this doesn't make sense with this, doesn't cast aspersions on the scriptures. It casts aspersions on your ability to, to understand without God revealing to you what that means. Does that make sense? The scriptures aren't the problem. We are. So we need God to open our eyes, our blind eyes, to see what the scriptures teach. And then the last thing I want you to see that it, it kind of shows that the reliability of Luke's writing is, is, is so trustworthy is that he wrote it down. It says here in um, verse 3, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you. One last way we see, they're written down. This is so helpful, because here's the deal. We are prone to change accounts to fit our understanding, our desires, or our doubts. Maybe to tickle ears or be popular. We're tempted to ignore parts of, of truth, parts of, of uh, accounts that we are given, uh, to put our own spin on it. But when something is written down, it remains unchanged. Thankfully, God has given us his written word that the life and teachings of Jesus are preserved and can always be referred to for our reorienting or reacquainting ourselves with them, basing our life on rock-solid truth and not sandy untruth. Look, people do this all the time. They take a, they take a, a scripture or passage that they read, and they let it kind of filter through their mind, and instead of going back to what the Word actually says, they kind of put their own... revealed graciously from an infinite God, not a false reality created from a finite human mind. This, this is absolutely huge. If there is a truth, and we can know it, then to know it, and to know its truth, is the biggest blessing of all. 
than to be able, rather than, than, than living in a delusion of a false. of this truth, not an ignoring of it. He's, he's encouraging a faith built on truth, not just trusting blindly with no knowledge. It's not like he's trying to hold some secret information from you just so you can believe in Christ. He's like, no, I want you to know everything about him because that will give you faith in him because it's true. He's encouraging a continual growth in the knowledge of the word so as to build our faith. So does that describe you. Lastly, I want to look at the implications of this true gospel. This is where it hits home for us this morning. I have three implications, and they're pretty clear. The first implication is this. We can have certainty of the gospel because of the fact. Like Theophilus, we can have certainty that the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and their implications are true. Again, not some fanciful tale someone dreamed up just to make sense of life. These were actual events of an actual Jesus who came to bring an actual salvation to an actually sinful people. Gosh, isn't it so comforting to know that we know the truth. Certainty that Luke is trying to give Theophilus and us. My boys were, but Steph and I weren't. We stayed up to, you know, watch the ball drop and do the whole thing. But something was happening on New Year's that that was undeniable. The clock was ticking. And in a matter of a second, 2018 was going to be in the past, and it was going to be 2019. And there was absolutely nothing that anybody could do about that. Every plan, every celebration, every, every resolution, every, all the things surrounding New Year's Eve revolved around the ticking of a clock. One thing. To, to deny and pretend that that clock was wrong was foolish and obviously absurd. I'm not going to celebrate my New Year's until January 2nd. We'll count down. The, okay, fine. Great. But you're already in 2019. It's kind of, you know, everything revolves around that. And to, to pretend that everybody else is under some type of delusion and that you really have the right time, kind of foolish. It's a different reality based on untruth. Stephen Cole says this. Postmodernism is the prevailing philosophy of our day. A main tenet of this philosophy is that there is no such thing as absolute truth. Rather, truth is personal and it's subjective. It's not discovered, but created. We see that. Nowadays, boys are girls and girls are boys. <coughs> I'm not trying to make light of people who are struggling with gender identity, but it's just not true. 
in our day, <laughs> babies aren't babies and can be ripped from their mother's womb. And even if they are babies, they're a part of the woman's body to do with whatever she wants. Relative truth. In our day, we, we justify treating certain classes or races of people certain ways because of our own subjective spin on truth. In our day, people break laws and they justify their need to break laws because of just what they need. Any lifestyle nowadays is okay. Truth can be relative to how you see it and what you experience, they say. All religions can lead you to God, they say. There really is no one truth, they say, and to claim so is arrogant and not seeking to coexist with others. Laugh when you see those bumper stickers. Yet, in declaring that there is really no one truth, they declare a truth. And so contradict themselves in blatant hypocrisy. It's delusion. The gospel of Jesus is verifiable truth with eternal implications, and to deny it is foolish. Go cluck, a, go cluck around like a chicken and say you're a chicken and see how foolish you are. You're not a chicken. You've got to deal with truth. Jesus truly did come to seek and save that which was lost. That's you and me. He truly, we truly do have sin that needs forgiven. And if it's not, we will, we will truly spend an eternity in hell. There truly was a Savior who is God, his name is Jesus, who came to bear the punishment for our sin on the cross. That truly happened. And the implication of that is true. He truly raised from the dead. He truly defeated sin. And the truth is that if you put your faith and your trust in him and give, you, give him your life, that he will forgive you truly of your sin. And you will truly have forever with him eternally. It's true. This gospel truth was passed from our witnesses to Luke. He believed it, wrote it down for Theophilus and us, and now it's passed on to you. God cares enough about you to deliver this truth to you as he cared about Luke and Theophilus, that you may respond to it before it's too late. So what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Again, this pastor's name I can't pronounce. After reading him, he's like, if you're not a Christian, and and you hold to some worldview, how certain are you of that worldview? Is it really enough? Does it just make you feel good for the moment? Or, or if you really objectively test it, if you really objectively look at your worldview, does it really hold the weight and the burden of verifiably true? Are you really going to base your life in eternity based on what you think, what you feel, what you want to think, and what you want to feel? Or are you going to respond to what's true? He goes on to say, talk about how, have you really tested and tried Christianity? Because I'm here to tell you, you can throw any question, any research, anything against the Christian faith, and it will stand. And so how are you going to respond to truth? Your life is not a game. Your life is not Russian roulette. It's not a roll of the dice. It doesn't have to be. There is a gospel, a verifiable gospel, that has been revealed and delivered to you. You can respond to truth. You don't have to live in uncertainty anymore. Lastly, last implication, because the gospel is true, we've got to share it. I'm fearful that while we say we believe the Bible is true, we really aren't treating the Bible as fact and the truth that it is because our lives aren't being changed. We say, yeah, it's true. You know, when I say things like postmodernism and stuff, you're like, yeah, tell them, preacher, you know, yeah, boys are, boys are boys and girls are girls. And you know you're not supposed to 
kill a child in the womb. And you're like, yeah, I believe all that. But then when, when the gospel starts to hit those very areas of our lives that we struggle with, we selectively obey. And we act like it's not truth because we're not obeying it. We don't let the truth change. It's the gospel changing you. Specifically in the area of evangelism. Are you obeying the commands within the gospel itself to go and share the gospel? Luke was convinced of the gospel that he wrote about. The commands of Jesus to share the gospel that he wrote about. He lived in the he lived it in the actual writing of it to Theophilus. Sure, he may have had a broader audience in mind, but he addressed it to one man. He did all this research and, and gave his research to one man. He did all he used all this work to reach one man. That his faith may be strengthened. How hard are you working to make sure that that one person in your life that needs to trust in Jesus more does so? So here's a very practical application for us as we close. Begin to think about it. those people in your life that are close to you that don't know Jesus. And if you're not doing so already, begin to pray for them. And here's what I want you to do too. Your Christian friends here in this room, your Sunday school classes, your small groups, your, you know, uh, XYZs and men's prayer breakfasts and, and our Wednesday night groups and all that. Begin to share these names with those people that you're living life with, these Christians that you're living life with. And as a group, join with each other and support one another and pray that the truth of the gospel would come to those in your life that you want to see impacted by. Here's the truth. Luke uh, quotes Jesus, and I'm not going to get the verse exactly right, but here's the, here's the basic premise. That Jesus is like, Jesus is the cornerstone. He's a stone. And if you reject Jesus, you stumble over him and reject him, Scripture says you're going to be broken to pieces. And if that stone falls on you in condemnation and judgment, it will crush you. The rock-solid truth, Jesus is not going to move. We need to move. We need to give in to him. And so if you're not a believer, don't reject him and so stumble over him and be broken to pieces. Don't let his condemnation eventually, and it will if you don't trust him, his condemnation come and crush you forever. Give in to him. And if there are folks in your life that don't know Christ, pray by God's grace that they don't stumble over the rock and or get crushed by it, but that they give in to Jesus. And that's what we're praying this year. We're going to have an intentional focus this year on reaching people in our life of Christ. And so begin to pray that way and begin to act that way and begin to shift your 2019 focus toward that way. And we'll do that together as a church. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the great gospel of Christ. And we got to thank you that, that we can live in, in the certainty of its truth. God, I see so many of us out here today. God, I have no way of knowing how you're dealing with each heart. Maybe there are some who have never come to faith in Christ for salvation and they need to do so. God, I pray by your mercy and your grace that if there are any in this room this morning that have not trusted in the salvation of Christ, that by your spirit you would give them mercy and you would open their eyes. You would let them see truth and respond to truth and put faith in Christ for salvation.
for those of us who have been pretty comfortable in our walks with Jesus, confront us with the truth of this word. That we have no place to be lukewarm. We have no place to just get settled and get, get in a rut. Your, your gospel is truth and it has to be obeyed and it has to be shared. And so God, get us off our tails and get us to the world who needs you. Thank you, God, that you didn't leave us blind. That you loved us enough to give us, give us truth. And truth that has eternal implications for our lives. You're a good, good God.